And I, I think we, we want to uh, welcome uh, a very special guest and uh, over to you, Emmy. Yeah, so we have another journalist uh, from US, Miles O'Brien, you're online. Hello, Hi, Miles. how are you? Good to see Good. you. Good, how are you? Very well, very well. Uh, let me introduce hey a little bit about yourself. Um, how about you? Um, so Miles is a scientist, a scientific and techno technology and aerospace journalist. And I think some of you might have seen him on uh, news programs such as uh, NewsHour on PBS and uh, Frontline. And she was also a correspondent for CNN. She, he produced many documentaries and he's won awards such as like six Emmys, is that right? And a Peabody and a DuPont. And he's been to uh, Japan after the tsunami and uh, Fukushima, Fukushima accident six times. And I think I met you several times when he when you were in uh, Safecast office in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Welcome, yes. Miles. Congratulations, Welcome, Miles. Safecast, on uh, turning a, you know what they say, never waste a good crisis, right? You took a crisis and you made something really positive, not just for Japan, but for the whole world, the whole idea of democratizing data, of allowing citizens to get their own facts and not have to rely on people they may or may not trust is incredibly powerful. And in today's world, you, you guys were so far ahead of your time in realizing how important this is in the world of this crazy echo chamber of fake news that we live in. I just, uh, I, I couldn't be more proud of you. I'm glad I was there near the beginning. And uh, I wish in all my heart, I was there right now, helping celebrate in person, telling some stories for the news hour and others. So, uh, Miles, tell me about your uh, report on SafeCast. What was it about and when was it? Well, I came about four months after uh, the meltdown. I have I have the story queued up. I don't, do you want to see a little bit of it or is that, uh, yeah, sure. do we not have time? Yeah, we could put that on. I don't know, I don't, we'll see. I don't know how the audio is going to go here, but it, so there'll be some familiar faces. I, I've got to ask one question though. The question that's been on my mind since I started watching this, is that the same car? I, yes, it is. Same, same car. Same <laughs> car. So for us, you must have that thing rigged 20 ways to Sunday. I cannot believe it's still running. Unbelievable. All right. That's that's awesome. That is totally awesome. Yes, right, it, so it, more, Miles, more more recently, it is is starting to look more and more like the Blues Mobile from the Blues Brothers car. Uh, we're losing parts. Uh, for those who are online, I want to make Safe Cost Car go faster. We do have a donation option yeah, on our website. Just so want to mention that. And back to you, Miles. Yeah, there there it is. Um, I, Joe, do you remember? Can you see Joe? Or are you just listening? Joe's driving, uh, but Joe can oh, hear and imagine. Well, that's, that's never stopped him before. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so this is when we went to that um, that school. Do you remember going? That's that at school? the Mid that's the uh, Nanaha Community Elementary School. It's about I, I think we're about a kilometer from it right now. Did you yeah. hear that? We're very close to that school right now. In oh, why don't you pull yeah, in? We and can give us we an can update. hear Joe clearly. I, Asbi. All right, What's let that? me just try playing this thing and see if you, if you just tell me if you can hear it. Uh, I don't. Can I share a screen here? How do I do that? Uh, click on share screen. Yeah. Click on share screen. It's good to have a technical guy. Middle, with bottom, yes, you know. there is a green button. Say uh, share screen. Green button, share screen. Here we go. Yep. Share screen. All right. And we will play well, this bad boy just for a few minutes. It's a 10 minute piece because I'm kind of, I, I fall in love with my words sometimes. But um, all right. So hopefully, are you seeing uh, yep. Uh, yep. an anchor yep. man? Sure. All right. All right. So here's a little bit. You'll recognize a few of these people. Uh oh. Not hearing it. Are you hearing it? No. Nope. Ah, drag. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to say. Uh, I think you might need to share uh, sound. On so your... if you if you share, there's an option. Uh, maybe you want to stop and, and share for yeah. a moment. Or, and then when you share again and stop sharing, yeah. when you yep. share again, there is an option I in the share screen sharing. at the bottom that says share audio. Share. Oh, geez, you guys are good. Optimize for video clip. I might as well do that too. Huh? Yeah, we'll right, optimize for we video go. clip and 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 share audio. Yeah, it's 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 right. they're they're working on it. This is this is live. This is good. Oh wait a minute now. Yeah, you must install the Zoom audio device. Ah, oh, I blew uh, just, just say okay. Just do it. Should I just do it? Should we do this? Oh no no, let's go go ahead. Yeah. Maybe it works. Maybe it works. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Hang on one more time. We'll try it one more time. But in the meantime, we can talk about. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit while we're downloading things. I'm sorry I didn't prepare better for this. 
Uh, I am working on my latest Nova, not on nuclear, uh, but on electric airplanes, which is really kind of an interesting thing on its own right. Um, I, um, is Ray Ozzy still on? Ray. Are you still Are you there? Still yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah, jump I, in for I, a moment I there. Think this, I think your new device is awesome. I think that's a really cool thing. That's great. I really, I, I, I value that uh, opinion. Yeah. So thank you. Oh, gosh darn it. I'm not going to be able to get the audio to work. Okay. But well, you can imagine a story where <laughs> we're driving around Joe Moras, uh, Brian Moras, Peter Franken, uh, yeah, Bonner was in the car too. Yeah, everybody, everybody has a guy gi, and uh, and uh, we're uh, we're look at look at this reading. This is five point one seven micro C. That I, Joe, do you remember where that was? It was up in the hills, uh, maybe toward Namie. Is that right? I can't see right now. Five point one. It's hard. It's hard to say, but uh, yeah, maybe was maybe it? near Namie. Yeah, yeah, must yeah, be that area. Namie had some high numbers. Yeah. Remember, yeah. Hey, Joe, do you remember meeting this guy who was uh, remediating the soil? And he was scraping up soil. I think it was in Manami Soma. And uh, he was putting it in bags, and, yes. uh, which was great. Uh, two he was inches storing it in a driveway, remember? Yeah, and he didn't have a place to put it. So he stashed right. it behind a maternity hospital, which was just, uh, a, <laughs> which just right. classic, right? Can you, you can't make that stuff up, right? Yeah. And, uh, but then, so we, a after he left the bags behind, because he had no place to put them. Hey, have they found a place to put all this stuff by now? There's an Asby question if I ever um, heard one. I'll take that one, Miles. This is Asby. Uh, yeah. Yes, most of it, most of those big piles of bags are emptying out uh, and being stored uh, immediately north and south of Fukushima Daiichi in Futaba uh -huh. and Okuma in what's called the interim storage area, which actually today, later today, our volunteers will go and uh, sort of drive through there and show us the situation. So it's taking years, it's years behind schedule, but it's going forward. And a little well, later we have it a, makes a good sense. In that area. It makes good sense to keep it near the plant, doesn't it? But when we were there, yeah. that, that was a 0.8 micro sieverts, and they left those bags, or I, I assume those bags are gone by now. Maybe you guys can drive by and check it out. That's Fumio Asahi, who is my uh, local producer. She and Joe made all the magic for sure. This is my, when I first came, in July uh, for Frontline, we drove up uh, the coast through Sendai and uh, that was my first taste of the, uh, you know, the tsunami devastation, the tsunami and earthquake devastation. We ran into this woman, her, if you look behind her there, that slab was her house. And she was there because she missed her plants and she was there trying to transplant as many of the plants as she could. And she was living in one of those incredibly tiny, um, you know, temporary housing facilities. Who knows how long uh, she had to stay there. Um, do you, uh, Joe, I, I don't think you were with me on this. This is a, he was at University of Sendai. He's a paleontologist who had done some research on previous tsunamis and had found um, uh, depositions in the soil, which indicated that the tsunami uh, distance could have gone much higher than TEPCO had predicted. Do you remember I, who I believe he said? was trying to contact TEPCO for a couple of years before the disaster even and was getting no uh, attention whatsoever. Completely got the stiff arm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he was fascinating, but you know, he was just, so, he was so frustrated because he'd been trying to tell them and they paid no attention. It would have cost them just a, I don't know, what, four or five million bucks to move one generator up on the cliff up on the, you know, above the excavated area. Hey, Joe, do you remember going, there was a, 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 an elderly couple, uh, rice farmer, small plot, probably about five miles or less from the um, plant. I, I forget yeah. which town. And we went back to their home. Do you remember that trip? That was in Nadaha. Yeah. So yeah. they, so they, was this, was it, was it yeah. yeah, it was the first time she had gone back. And, um, we, we went in through their house and it, and it had been in his family for 500 years, which, you know, of course in Japan, that's not too unusual as for an American ear, that sounds, you know, nothing is 500 years, right? It, much less one home. And uh, it was uh, at that moment, uh, and Joe, I think you were rolling on this. She, she realized, you know, she, she had, they had the, the stoic Japanese facade going and then she realized on camera that she wasn't coming back ever. 
and uh, just lost it. It was it was one of the I, 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 it was one of the more emotional moments I've ever been through, just because it really the whole thing just hit me like a ton of bricks there. Uh, Joe, do you remember? Can you? See, I don't know if you can see that we did bring everywhere we went. We had uh, Geiger counters, B Geigies, you name it. We were taking data. Do you remember who this guy was? I can't see well enough from my from this side. Anyway, of the bar. this is we were taking readings everywhere we went, but uh, and this was in um, we were they were planting rice um, in a manner that would probably reduce the uptake of cesium. And then there's the famous drone incident of uh, 2016. <laughs> The famous, oh. <laughs> and, and so this is, if you'll see over here, this is, um, can you see Joe there? That's, a, that's where we're going right now, Miles. That's Tomioka. Yeah. Okay, Tomioka. Tomioka. Right so, so this is photographer Cameron Hickey, surrounded by, by the way, as we uh, were there and got caught flying the drone, in this case, interestingly, over Fukushima Daini, um, we, we got caught and uh, I, I had done my um, research and I knew that there was no rule against drone flying over the uh, nuclear facilities. Uh, but, um, you know, you couldn't fly a helicopter or a plane, but nobody had contemplated drones. They were still new enough, right? So we flew it and uh, somebody ratted us out. I can't remember. And- uh, uh, just came across us on the road. Oh yeah. And, and, and Joe, Joe is, is a pretty guilty party. He looks really guilty because he starts running. Just he sees the cop, he runs, you know? So, <laughs> so immediately they know we're up to something, right? So, you know, cause I, the drone was in flight. We could have just said, oh, hey officer, just, you know, hoped it stayed up long enough to, uh, for the encounter. But uh, anyway, so the drones land and wave after wave of cars come in. I think at one time, I don't know, Joe, did we have 20 officers around us? Getting close it to that, 20. I imagine. Yeah. But each mile, the, one of the critical things was that uh, the next time they came across us, we were launching the drone to get video of the uh, uh, one of the overhead radiation monitors, right? And right. another cop car pulled up, and it's two young cops from southern Japan, and they asked, what are you doing? And they, by that time, they had all our names because it's in everybody's notebook, right? Right. And these two cops, when they heard what we were doing, they parked their car diagonally across the road and blocked traffic so you yes. could get the shot. Yes. So it was really, it was really a different experience each time we met uh, met policemen. Yeah, you guys, uh, you guys would know what these armbands say, but a as each car came up, the, the guys seemed to have higher and higher rank. And I think, you know, Joe, uh, we didn't. It was you. You were the full extent of our uh, Japanese uh, capability yeah. for that event. Uh, my sense of it was that they actually called Tokyo to see if there was yeah. anything they should do, right? They, they did, and what, what happened was, you know, about halfway through, when it was clear that they weren't going to arrest us, they couldn't have any arrested for. Um, I started negotiating for how close we could get to the plant, and what they were saying was, no, you can't fly it over the plant. You can't fly it from here. I said, well, how about if we go up to the dam where the famous, you know, Fukushima television was shot, the explosion shot was taken from? And they said, oh, that's fine. I said, okay, well, that's seven kilometers. How about three kilometers? And they were asking us, you know, there was no rules. There was rules coming out. They were asking everyone to stand down on drones. And what I said was, well, this is maybe our last chance to do this legally. So we want to do it today. And eventually, remember, they gave us permission to fly where we were um, as long as we didn't go over the plants. Yes. Exactly, which um, which brings us to our next chapter in drone flying in Fukushima Prefecture. You're seeing, uh, Joe, you were not with us for the flight over the plant, were you? Oh, yes, I was. Uh, oh, da Daiichi? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, you were there. Okay, so. You know, you know that spot? That's where we put one of our sensors this last week. Or two weeks ago. Well, it's, the, it's like, the, you know, being in the exclusion zone, you stick like, like a sore thumb no matter what. So this is like, there's a sit, this one underpass, which happens to be up, you know, on the rise above the plant. And it's a good, um, it's two kilometers at least to the plant, right? Yep. Actually, uh, 1,800 meters. Okay. So there's so a close boundary. But the farthest, when we were on the far side of the plant over the ocean, that was three kilometers from the transmitter. Which is technically, you know, right on the ratty edge of the drone, except we did have the advantage of elevation. So, right. and uh, so we, we flew, we, we set off. This is by, by the way, we had already done all of our tours for the, through the plant, all of our interviews. Uh, we, you know, I didn't want to get in trouble and lose the rest of the story. So this is the absolute last shot in the film. And so we went there and launched the drone and we got these shots. Oops, that's, that's a fishing boat. Where did I do it? Hang on, I gotta find that shot, those, the, the drone shots. 
Well, we'll talk, we can talk about Kasha Zaki Karwa later. Um, where is this? Hang on a sec. Underneath the uh, the tarpaulin, that's in the control room. What's that? Yeah. All right. So hang on, I'll get you there. And so, as far as I know, okay. So this is what we got um, in the way of shots, and where, you're not seeing that anymore, are you? I've got it over here. Let me stop sharing screen here for a moment. Okay. So now you see. Okay. So see this. This is we flew right over. The, um, the drums. I don't think we, we see. Uh, so we, our drone is like, we should have put a sensor on the drone. Why didn't we do that, Joe? Did you think about that? You must've thought about that. Well, we did think of it. We had the sensor on another drone and we said we didn't have time to fly on both. Yeah. And the shot was more important. So I figured we, we did, we did two or three flights. I can't recall at least two. Cause I'd said, let's go do one quick one grab the card, and then if we lose the drone, we lose the drone, you know, it's, it's uh, we lose, you know. We went, we, went, we went twice, Miles. We went in the evening, at, uh, just after sunset, and then you and I and Cameron got up at 3 a.m. Ah, uh, that's sunrise. right. Yeah, yeah. But it was so, as far as I know, I think right after that, they banned drones uh, in, um, over the uh, plants in a specific way. So we might have been the, uh, <laughs> we might have caused that little piece of trouble. Yes. But um, Miles, Miles yeah. uh, a little bit later uh, in the morning here, or a little bit late after this, we're going to show some of the footage of, of, of things that Joe has shot with his drone. Not that sure exactly when and what, we'll talk about it later, but we will have some drone footage planned uh, a little bit later in the, in, in, in the event, so. Yeah, yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, it, when you think of the the value of uh, being able to uh, you know get over and you know what, what we on this trip this was one of our um, I think this was the trip we did in uh, February of twelve uh, Joe when we brought yeah that's the, it that's also uh, further south uh, yeah then yep and but drones were drones are really just kind of you know just kind of happening and it was uh, very yeah very uh, edgy back then very new. That's actually long. Well, that was before you had the one that before we had the Inspire Two that Cameron brought. That oh, yeah, was the no, old no. Uh, flame wheel these that were, you had. These were kind of you know uh, back when you had to be you know a real maker. You remember this trip on the? Uh, uh, what was? Oh it? yeah, yeah. To it catch the halibut. It was the coldest. Out there fishing for fish they cannot sell just for the the, the purposes of. Uh, you remember, space. Miles? You wanted to go closer to the plants. And the uh, the owner of the boat was like, no, no, we're at the limit. And his son was totally on it. He was he was steering right. He wanted to go. Yeah, yeah. That's Diney. So we we spent a lot of time at Diney in this uh, simulator there, uh, where they're you know they're practicing uh, various uh, emergency scenarios. Turned out to be fantastic B-roll for stuff. But everywhere we went, uh, we had you know this security guy, and uh, you know they they would they would check every shot literally every oh. shot it was just it was ridiculous and so um when it came time when we came back on the last uh trip which was for the uh the last documentary we did for nova uh we, we spent a huge amount of time negotiating with tepco trying to figure out um a sim more simplified way to do it and so we finally they said well you can shoot the plant as long as you don't shoot any of the entrances any of the fences or any of the security measures. So now imagine that for a moment. What does that leave? Nothing, right? There's nothing left to shoot, right? Zero. So we finally got them to agree to, uh, we, were, we were willing to, uh, and Nova went along with it, we would do a security review before we left the country with their team to see what uh, shots were okay and what this shots This is different last week. You guys okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The roads change. The roads change. <laughs> we're in Tomioka, and the roads are different than they were a week ago. <laughs> anyway, so we spent a whole day in Tokyo at the end of this, going through each and every shot, putting blurs on them, and uh, which the, the security guys were like, you know, whatever, just do the blur, and, and, and then this is a pretty good place actually. We, uh, it, it was just just for show. Anyway, so um, I think that um, you guys. Uh, uh, I wish I could share that story, but uh, the uh, you guys have done some great work over the years, and it's just been really, as a reporter, it's been great to have. I mean, I you know so so much of what I did, so much of what I put on TV, literally could not happen without you guys. So uh, you know, you you've done 
it's not just the data, it's, it's the awareness and, and the way you have helped uh, honest brokers of information tell the story, which is a great, you know, you should be so proud. Thanks. <laughs> and, and you've been great for SafeCast too. So it's been really, you know, great to work with you and have this long uh, communication relationship. So now, Miles, we're at, uh, at Tomioka. Uh, where it's underneath where the drone basically was when we got accosted by when the first policeman showed up uh, and that led to, you know, 20 policemen uh, looking over our shoulders. Uh, and this, the area here, you wouldn't recognize it. All of the, uh, the buildings that were damaged and the, the old train station has been completely demolished and rebuilt about 200 meters away, away from where it was. And uh, it's, it's very difficult to even recognize the area here now. Oh yeah, that's so, shot now. That's at Kashiwazaki Kariwa. Uh, you and me at. Uh... Yeah, yeah, that's when we were, we were on the other side of the. We went. Uh, of course, Tepco. I, I you know, not, none of these plants are open. I I, I checked. I think what do you have? Four or five reactors are, are operating at this point. Is that it? Yep. Yeah. So um, it's um, yeah, it's uh, I don't know what happened there, but. Um, you know, they wanted to open up that KK plant. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, right? No, and at the time that we were doing those stories, the, the story of Daini was still sort of pending. They weren't sure if they were going to decommission it or operate it. Right. And yeah. uh, that's now been decided that they're going to completely decommission it. Yeah, this is uh, Masuda-san in, in, at Daini. Yeah, at that time we were, you were, that was at the, uh, the spent fuel in the unit three at Daini. And the, fu the reactor was still fueled at that time. And look where we were, right That under, is in the, the control right rod under actuation chamber inside the pedestal under unit three at Daini. Um, we had a, a 180 second time budget to film there. Um, and, and when our three minutes were up, it was, you, you were still shooting and people were saying, we got to go, we got to go. We wound up staying there six minutes, which was double our, you know, our dose allowance. But it was just so important and so fascinating. Yeah, yeah. That's, the, um, uh, you remember the wall, the, the, the graffiti? Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Oh, you mean in the, in the control room? No, no, in there, in that chamber under the pedestal, the engineers had written, you know, little little markings to each other with with sharpies. You know, this uh, this motor has a sticky stepper motor. Uh, this one has a, you know, just yeah. little uh, like I like say technical graffiti to from from generation to generation of the engineers for what's going on with the plant. It was that's the uh, kind of thing you don't see in the manuals or in the designs uh, when you look at these reactors. Well, you know, I, I, I still get kind of chills when I think about going into the uh, control room at uh, Daiichi. And um, we were there with the, the, the head operator who was there on that fateful afternoon and uh, right. who was an amazing guy. But seeing the pencil scrawlings on the green panels, you know, where they were right. trying to record levels, they, you know, obviously they, they were using flashlights. They were completely in the dark. All of them thought they were going to die. And, mm -hmm. um, and we had a brief interview with him, which was incredibly compelling, right? And um, he, um, it, we, we timed out and they, we had to leave. And uh, he was gracious and, you know, like so many people in Japan never said no. Uh, and we followed up with him. We said, we, we would love to sit down with you and do a proper interview at a later time when we can do this in a more relaxed way instead of being in these suits. And uh, went through literally multiple negotiations, got all the way to the, the, the CEO of TEPCO, and he, um, he refused to do it. And what, what, uh, it, it, it led me to an insight that I didn't fully appreciate, which all of you guys know very well. But in Japan, uh, there is a sense of individual responsibility, guilt, and blame that we don't have in America. I mean, he is an individual felt deeply guilty, responsible, ashamed for what happened at Fukushima. And as, as I said to him, you know, to an American mind, that's crazy, right? You know, we, we don't think that way. And, uh, and I said, besides, there was nothing you did wrong. To the contrary, you were positively heroic, prepared to die there, literally, to save the plant as best you could, did everything you could. But he wouldn't even take that. He wouldn't even take that on board. And, and, and his neighbors shunned him. Uh, he lived very near the plant. It was it was just devastating to me to hear that um, that idea. In a way, it's it's very it's extremely honorable that every individual would take on that kind of corporate greater responsibility, but also completely unfair. Yeah, I disagree. Yep. Uh, I we have other people we know that 
TEPCO who, um, you know, have experienced the same thing, experiencing that sense of regret and responsibility. And actually, we have a, a video coming up before long with uh, Mr. Ishizaki, uh, whose job it was to go talk to the residents of Fukushima about their compensation payments. What do they need? What do they need? What do they want? And to basically be, to take a beating uh, on behalf of the company uh, because he felt personally guilty too. So this yeah. is something, you know, TEPCO has a lot wrong with it, but there are people who, who really want to try to make things better as well. So, um, and, and there is this consistent sense of responsibility and the, the, the notion that they can never make amends. But I would say probably there's a huge gap between the head office in Tokyo and their thinking and the thinking of the people who work for TEPCO here in Fukushima who are part of the communities. Yeah, a much so, greater yeah. responsibility. Asli, Asli, we have a question here from Emmy. Can she come in? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so do you think, uh, Miles, do you think that uh, TEPCO has learned anything in the last 10 years? What, what do you no, say? It's funny because, you know, I went on my last trip, which was, you know, basically we did a lot of stuff right around the fifth anniversary. So it's been a while now. But I had the sense, you know, we uh, the, my entry point to TEPCO was through um, uh, uh, the the Americans that were advising me, uh, Dale, uh, God, I'm forgetting Dale's last name. Joe, what's Dale's last name? The, the former nuclear NRC commissioner, uh, Dale. Um, it's not Dale uh, Evans. Dale, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, Dale Evans, but that was <laughs> not Dale Avengers. Evans. But anyway, he he and uh, I'll think of it in a bit. And um, Lake Barrett, who's a technical advisor, were um, and I believe they're still. I, I think is that advisory board that they're a part of still in existence. You, we just lost you. I can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted. Yes. Okay. I don't think there's any way to find out. I haven't. I don't have contacts inside. Anyway, the so people we knew in Denver are gone. So I'm. Was it Dale kind of, Klein? Dale Klein. Dale Klein. Dale that's Klein. Right. Dale yeah. Klein. So anyway, so. Dale Klein was on, uh, along with some other uh, Western um, nuclear experts were on this advisory board and they were trying to push TEPCO to uh, communicate with the West, uh, the likes of me. That's how I got, uh, you know, increased access as time went on. And so, um, I, you know, in interviewing the, the high ranking officials from the sea level on down, Masuda san all these people, you know, they, they talked a very... Uh, strong game of being candid and forthcoming and having learned their lesson and listening to, um, you know, kind of the Western way of, of distributing information, et cetera. And, uh, but I, I never saw, you know, you, you, you go to their website, you don't see much evidence of that. It's still the same dense data dumps, which are practically incomprehensible. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a history major who covers science, so I'm, I've already got a disadvantage, right? I'm, I'm kind of handicapped when it comes to my beat. But then TEPCO, they would say, well, we released the information, but it wasn't released ever in a useful way. And, uh, and they, you know, they were pushing very hard to get KK open. At that time, they were still pushing for Diney to come open. And, um, and they were also trying to lay the groundwork to release the water because you know, it only contains tritium. And, and we come to find out in just recently that there's a lot more in there besides tritium and they've been holding out. They wouldn't let people go in and test it. The likes of you guys could have gone in and tested that and had an objective view of We've what's offered. in that water, right? And they never did. So uh, the, that's a long way of saying, I mean, I don't think they've learned their lesson, which is a terrible thing to say after all this time and all the, the heartache and um, you know the, the, the tragedy of, of that, that couple who lost their home and all the others. Well, I think 40,000 displaced, I read the other day still, which is, you know, that, that each one of those is a tragedy like that, that couple that couldn't go back to their home. And to be so callous about it and not really understand why you communicate. And I realize, you know, some of this is just the way corporations operate the world over, but there is a deep um, cultural um, bias against sharing information uh, in, in that society, I think. Uh, which makes it even harder. And uh, so, um, so that's a long way of saying your, to your answer, no. <laughs> yeah. It's like there's an allergy to transparency. Yes. It's like just yes. this fundamental institutional allergy to it. Um, they have to be pushed kicking and screaming. Uh, and then they will just do something, uh, you know, just for show to say, oh, we're being transparent, but it's not really transparent. 
Absolutely. We had a pretty significant earthquake. I guess it was deemed an aftershock from 10 years later, uh, just yeah. last month in February. And again, there were new cracks and, and the water levels were falling in the, the basements of the reactor at Daiichi. And the main message we got out was everything's fine. Don't worry. Which is exactly the same pattern <laughs> from 10 it's years ago. It. It's almost yeah. a, it's a direct quote practically. Yeah. Well, so they, the, the thing is, if they ever had a chance of releasing that water, I would say that ship has sailed, literally and figuratively. So now what they have to do is they, they better beef up those tanks because those tanks right. are going to be there for a long time and there's going to be more earthquakes, right? Yeah. And they better be resistant, seismically resistant. And they're just going to have to keep, you know, Sorcerer's Apprentice style. They're going to have to keep mm -hmm. uh, building tanks and, and holding water there indefinitely, right? I mean, I, with, with right. the tritium and all the other witches brew in there, I mean, how many hundreds of years will that water be tainted i mean it's it's yeah. it's a long long process so, it's a good but question I, I yeah. pardon me i said it's a good question right yeah and and, well, uh, I mean, and we'll, if, you know what we should do we should push to go in there i mean has anybody yet independently measured it or are the uh, the readings we've gotten so far based on tepco measurements it's only tepco data and some from jaea they, they measure some water with other uh, agencies and other organizations measure some of the water that's already released from the sub drains and from the bypass, but not from uh, the, the storage area. And as you know, Dr. Bissler at Woods Hole, uh, Ken Bissler, you know, he's been pushing for this. We've been talking about this for years, literally, and they've been unable to get access. And we'll hear from, from him later uh, today talking about the same issue and what could be done or should be done with those tanks. But I think you're right. I think they should really investigate long-term storage. Uh, you know, at least for the half-life, tritium half-life is like 12 years at least a few half lives of the tritium, so that comes down. Uh, but it's it's just one problem generating another problem. Okay. You know, you know the story is couched as the fishermen of Fukushima, and that that is obviously yeah. very relevant, very important. It's their livelihoods. But you know what? The whole world deserves to know what's in those tanks, right? The, the, this is our ocean. This is the Pacific Ocean, and there is a responsibility there that they're shirking, frankly. So when, when the travel restrictions ease up, I would love to come and try to push them to let us do independent uh, analysis of this water. Maybe we could do a story where we do our own analysis. That would be- Bring your, bring your own scientists, bring Ken. That, we'll bring Bissler, we'll bring Bissler yeah, over. Great idea. Do it. Great idea. Yes, okay. Just, just, just on, on that note, uh, Miles, uh, we, we have been in dialogue with, with TEPCO for, for some long time to get one of our monitors uh, you know, independently monitor at the plant, and you know, though we have had, you know, uh, you know, discussions, that has never happened. And I think the independent monitoring is really a big deal in these in these accidents. Even you know, over the last year, ever, the whole planet has gone through COVID, and the first thing that went wrong is 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 data, no clarity, no measurements, uh, and all these things, causing tremendous amount of confusion, damage, and. I think so. I think this independent monitoring of the water, the levels, the, the, the things that were at the plant still remains a big, you know, a, a big lack after after so many years. Um, I know that we're having a great discussion, but we're also looking at at our watch and we have to kind of start to continue the program. Miles, please hang, stay on the line and we're going to have a few more things happening. So feel free to chip in. Uh, okay. And uh, we're now going to switch to the to the next uh, to 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 the next uh, 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 item on, on on our program, and uh, I just wanted to repeat again for everybody who's watching, Safecast is a non-profit organization. We solely are dependent on donations and grants. If you feel inspired, uh, do check out our donation page or go to our shop or check out the the air note and and find ways to participate in our project. Uh, this is only the first 10 years of hopefully what will be an eternal journey of, of citizens uh, coming together to measure uh, together. So, Miles, again, thank you so much. Uh, Asbi, I want to give the word back to you because I think sure. you're going to introduce us to the next guest. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so uh, Miles, thank you so much. Thank you, thank Miles. You. Thank Thanks, you Miles. for inviting me and keep fighting the good fight, guys, and stay, stay in touch, okay? All right. And, and drive be. safely, Maras. Drive safely. <laughs> Why should I change right. now? <laughs> right. See you guys. Thank you, Miles. Okay. Thank you.